everyone present in this event, I would like to wish a very good morning to us all. From the Department of Urology, Kobe University Graduate School of Medicine, Honorable Professor Katsumi Shigemura, MD, PhD. From the Department of Microbiology, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, UGM, Professor Tri Wibawa, PhD, Specialist, Microbiology Clinic, Consultant. From the Division of Urology, Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health, and Nursing of UGM, Dr. Dr. Indra Warman, Specialist Urology, Recording in Progress. Respected professors and doctors gathered here today. Please let me introduce myself. I am Sharla Nashita Sandi, and I am honored to be here as a Master of Ceremony for this event. We express our deepest gratitude for joining us in the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health, and Nursing of the Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta. It is truly an honor to have such distinguished guests joining us today. We are here for our guest lecture on minimally invasive surgery in urology and urinary tract infection held by the Division of Urology, Department of Surgery, FKKMK. Honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, to commence this meeting, we would like to invite the head of the organizing committee for this event to present his opening speech. I would like to invite to the stage Dr. Dr. Prahara Yuri, Special Urology Consultant. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. First, I want to respect all the honorable teacher. First, from Kobe University, Prof. Katsumi Sigimura. And then, uh, the Vice Dean in Academic, Dr. Hamim Sadewa, MD, PhD. And then, all staff from Urology, Dr. Indra Warman, Dr. Ahmad Zulfan, and also all collaborators in the research between amongst uh, UG, uh, Faculty of Medicine, UGM, and also Kobe University, and also uh, Taiwan Medical University. And also, uh, uh, thank you for our student and resident who are coming here. I hope we can uh, get more knowledge and also can improve our knowledge in the field of our urology, especially endourology, and also the cor uh, connectivity in uh, urinary tract infection. To not uh, make a long time in a speech, I think that's all uh, of my greeting today. I hope you can enjoy this meeting and also the guest lecture today. Uh, thank you for attending this le lecture. Wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Yuri, for the opening speech. Now, for the opening ceremony for this event, we would like to invite the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health, and Nursing of UGM, Dr. Ahmad Hamim Sadewa, PhD, to give his opening remarks on stage. Good morning and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear professors, doctors, seniors, also residents, and also all participants this morning. First of all, I would like to express my happiness to be here with you all this morning on the behalf of the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing. I would like to welcome all of you to this occasion uh, visiting professor's lectures entitled Minimally Invasive Surgery in Urology and Urinary Tract Infection. Especially for our distinguished guest, Professor Katsumi Shigemura from Kobe University. Welcome to, to Jakarta. Kobe University is very special for me because I graduated from Kobe on 2005 under the supervision of Professor Hisai Dinesio. So I'm very happy uh, someday I will uh, uh, go to Kobe and meet Professor Shikimura again. 
Also, thank you very much for the uh, lecturers, Professor Trivibawa, also Dr. Indra Warman, who will give some uh, topics uh, about the urology. Ladies and gentlemen, minimally invasive surgery is our future methods. And deal with uh, many parts of the uh, surgical problems in urology and also in other diseases. This is in line with the programs from our Ministry of Health, what we call KGSO, dealing with the four catastrophic diseases as a one of the priority in health services. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, and urology, or KGSO, cancer, jantung, stroke, dan urologi. So hopefully that the, uh, this seminar will give us new insight on how minimally invasive surgery and also infection deal with the renal failure because we understand that the renal failure is caused by many conditions, diabetes, hypertension, also infections, also some traumatic uh, process which need a surgical treatment. So hopefully uh, we can have a very fruitful discussion. Please enjoy these uh, lectures and also future collaborations. Thank you very much and uh, also uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee, Dr. Prahaya Yuri, Dr. Ahmad Zulfan and team who uh, have prepared this event of visiting professor properly. Thank you very much and have a, a nice seminar and discussion. Good morning and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Dr. Hamim for giving us the warm speech. Now I would like to introduce to the stage the moderator for this event to guide our guest lecture for today from the Division of Urology, Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, UGM, Dr. Muhammad Halim Hanindia Kusuma. Um, my apologies, doctor. Uh, maybe we can get a photo session first. Uh, for the respected guests, we kindly invite to the stage. Check. I would like to introduce to the stage again the moderator for this event, Dr. Muhammad Halim Hanindia Kusuma. Thank you very much, uh, Sharla, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize because uh, my English is not so good as Sharla because using English, the problem is not 
for you, yeah, but the problem is for me. But I hope you, you all can understand uh, our discussion uh, this morning, and it is an honor for me to be able to let you through all these uh, very interesting discussion this morning. So the world of medicine evolves over time, and urology is one of the medical areas that involves in the such an advancement of medical development. So such development poses a challenge for healthcare patients and it highlights the importance and the necessity of professional sharing and collaboration. Hence in this occasion we are very happy to be able to host this meeting that hopefully would not only give us a new insight and knowledge but also serve as a foundation for future research and collaboration. So without further ado, let us introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is one of the youngest professors of urology from Kobe Graduate School of Medicine in Japan. He has so uh, he's done so many research in his particular interest is in urinary tract infection and urology oncology. He is also also had been practicing minimal invasive surgery, in, especially in the robotic surgery. And today, he would like to share to all of us his experience about robot neurologists. Professor Katsu Sigemura from Kobe University, Japan. Please come up to the stage and the time is yours. Please give a round of applause for him. Can I have a pointer? Good morning. My name is Katsumi Shigemura from Kobe University. So I have a collaboration of Dr. Yuri and the UGM from maybe 2017. And then first of all, we focus on the infectious disease and then spread to the cancer research and also recently going to the surgical technique, including robotic system. So, okay, so today I'd like to talk about the Japanese robotic system. You know the Hinotori? Uh, Hinotori is uh, uh, established in 2020. So, Kobe University and some uh, company, a company name is Medicaloid, which is, uh, uh, consists of the Sysmex and the Kawasaki uh, Corporation in Kobe. So, mostly, no, no, originally Kawasaki is a company for making the bicycle, bicycle and uh, robot for the industry. And the Sysmex is a company for the, uh, how to say, laboratory equipment, uh, such as, for instance, urine, sediment, analyzer, or, or so. So maybe they established the Medicaloid for making robotic surgical system, maybe 2013 or 14. And then two, from 2015, they and Kobe University cooperate with for making robotic surgical system, which is the first one in Japan. So this is a Kobe University's picture. And then, okay, today's agenda, because I have three topics in my presentation. First one is the background and the reasons for the development of domestic, Dome no, no, sorry. Domestic is important, domestic. And the next one is about Hinotori. The third one is the initial clinical case, clinical case report in Hinotori. So let me talk about the background and the reasons for the development of a domestic surgical robot. 
Okay, this is maybe many people knows. This is a Da Vinci system. So you can see that this is a cockpit surgeon. Surgeon right there. And then this is the assistant. And then this is a robotic robot. So Okay, robot consists of two parts. Maybe you know two parts. This part, I, we can see. This part and uh, this part. And uh, this is uh, uh, he uh, maybe handles the four arms in robot, and uh, he handles the two arms by himself. This is a Da Vinci system. Actually, Kobe University has two Da Vinci system and two Hinotori system. Okay, this is a Japanese robot makers, the, uh, the activity around the world. So you can see 2013, uh, Japanese robot makers occupy 62% of the world. The Europe is 24%. And then uh, 2017, this is maybe going up to the two, two, three point times expansion. This is still Japan's uh, robot makers. This is all of the um, robotic, robotic makers, not only surgeon, but also other uh, kind of use. Is Japan is also 56% is occupation. Europe is about 30%. It's 2017. But, okay. focusing on the medical robot commercialization in the world, United States one uh, occupies about 90%. So you know intuitive surgical? Intuitive surgical is Da Vinci about uh, 73%, and then also pyridic surgery by the, uh, made by the striker is about 10%, and then this is other, co other company. So US companies, about 90% 90, 90 is sharing in the world. So this is uh, how the problem is. Uh, USA made robots dominate the market overwhelmingly about 90%. And then medical robots in Japan rely on 100% um, is only import from the United States. This means uh, uh, about the economical issue is also very problematic. Japan um, paid to United States, and then they sell robots to our hospital. This is also problematic. So, and then Japanese robot makers have not entered this area until 2020. Then 2020, we made Hinotori for commercial, uh, how to say, commercialization. Okay, this is a story of the surgical support robot development. So purpose, purpose of the uh, development is to uh, develop medical robot Domestically, that will contribute to a society where everyone, patient, families, and healthcare workers can live with a peace of mind. And then please remember three important concepts of robotic surgical development. First one is, is safe operatively, safe operation. Next one is function can be used with no worries. And the third one is a human sized robot aiming to support humans and coexisting with humans. So this is a development cycle and the possess technology to meet the above keywords of medical robots. So please remember three technologies. Uh, red one, then three avoidance technology, human coexisting technology, and the three, uh, develop experience, knowledge about the robot. 
These three uh, technologies are very important to be considered. Okay, this is the history of the Hinotolid development. 2015, establishment of a master slave system. This is only five years. I heard uh, the Da Vinci case, it, will, it took maybe 20 years for establishment. We have only five years. 2016, improvement to the realized concept. Three concepts. 2017, realization of the more precise surgical operation. 2018, enhancement of the function of clinic. 2019, final preclinical assessment of function. Five years took, uh, was taken for the development of Hinotori. Okay, this is the uh, uh, story one. 2015, first prototype. First prototype like this, uh, very uh, small size. Applied industrial robot. Industrial robot applied to uh, robotic system, robotic uh, surgical system. Robot, uh, we focus on robot arms, actuators, remote control, the tactile functions. This is, uh, please remember, this is the uh, uh, first one of the uh, Hinotori, very tiny one. This is story two. Story two is an uh, improvement to realize the concept. So the concept is a surgical support robot is safe and no worries, and it can coexist with human. The final goal was to create a human arm. This is the story to second uh, the stage of the Hinotori, second prototype, is still uh, two arms. And uh, uh, still, how to say, uh, looks hard to move like this. This is story three. So realization of more precise surgical operation, story three. This is a people, surgeon. And then Hinoto is the back. Then this label at which surgery can be performed was defined. More details, smooth and precise surgical operation performed by physician using hand control. So human and the robot uh, was reflected like this. And the robot uh, need to imitate the human's uh, movement. This is the stage of the story three. And also, uh, third prototype in 2017, three years prior to the establishment. Okay, you can see the, this is a 3D viewer. Surgeon can see this image. This is the surgeon's movement of the hand. Uh, and then you can reflect on this image. This is pairing the fruits. Right, right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand, like this. Okay, this is the 2018 horse prototype. Enhancement of function of clinic 34. The, this uh, stage is robot like this. And then the previous configuration consists of a one endoscope and the two arms. But in actual surgery, the use of only two arms is not enough, except to uh, cause uh, uh, many problems. So we have changed the consists of the endos one endoscope and the three arms, and the whole total of four arms, like Da Vinci's one, is uh, uh, done in this situation. Okay, this is the final preclinical assessment of function. This is a story five. Fifth prototype in 2019 is uh, almost the same as the uh, uh, commercial one. This is a uh, uh, camera, and then one left-handed, the two right-handed. 
the design of each unit and the user interface was developed for mass production. Then Hinotori was born. This is uh, uh, Hinotori's uh, shape. Okay, uh, from now I'm going to talk about the Hinotori. Okay, this is a Hinotori. Hinotori is, uh, uh, how to say, Firebird. In English, name is Firebird. That is a very famous, uh, how to say, old cartoon in Japan. Maybe not so many people know. This is uh, made by the Osamu Tezuka. He's a medical doctor. Uh, he graduated from Osaka University. Then he and me uh, graduated from the same university in Osaka. This is a Hinotori. Okay, this is a Hinotori's uh, complete shape. This is a uh, robotic, right side, left side robotic system. And the right side is a surgeon control, surgeon cockpit feature of the surgical robot system. Compact and function robot arm, pivot point setting by software. The operation terminal based on the ego ergonomic design and the high definition 3D images. The network support system. This is a compact and function robot arm. Eight axis that enable smart and smooth movement like a human arm. Looks human arm. Okay, this is a pivot point setting by software. Maybe you can imagine this is a patient, patient abdomen, and then we set pivot pointing or insert movements. Uh, Fulcrums can be safe, can be set by software. And then this is smoothly movement. Uh, camera and the arms. Okay, this is a high definition full high definition images. So image uh, is very, very uh, much, much better than the uh, Da Vinci's one. This is operation terminal based on the ergonomic design. This is a foot switch. This is a uh, viewers. Uh, where a surgeon can see in abdomen, in inside of the abdomen, and then they surgeon can handle like this, uh, whatever he wants. Okay, this is a network support system, medicaloid, intelligent network system means operating room and the medical oil and the support center, we can cooperate with uh, together for uh, establishment of the safety surgery. Okay, this is a digital twin, uh, hematory operation units. Okay, this is a uh, camera, in the left hand to right hand. We can how to say exchange which one, which one. Okay, well, this is also digital twin. So this is right, right hand, left hand, and the right hand, left hand. So inside the how to say uh, pelvis, and then you can imagine this is a, how to say uh, interface. This is a remote support service. Uh, we can uh, contact with the uh, surgical no, no, operation room. And uh, this is uh, uh, one button, blue button. If once we push blue button, uh, this signal goes into the support center, and then we discuss for uh, safety surgeon, safety surgery. This is the approval of the Hinotori surgical robot system. Maybe from this year, we expand to the OBGYN and the general uh, surgeries. In urology, 
we use the malignant prostate cancer, malignant renal cancer, and the malignant bladder tumor, ureteral pyrrhoneos neostomy, and the sacro copopexy. Uh, maybe we cooperate with the OBGYN doctors. This is a, a medical oid in Port Island. And uh, this is our cancer center in Port Island. And uh, we can cooperate with uh, whole establishment, establishment or whole management of Hinotori. This is a training system for surgeons and for assistants. We have uh, uh, several kinds of training systems, training how to stage, and then uh, going to first cases, each other. So last one is the initial clinical report in Hinotori. This is a process cancer cases, 58 years old, and then clinical T2, N0, M0, and then Grison score 3 plus 4, and then hypertension, appendicitis, this is this spinal canal stenosis like that. No uh, physical findings or pre examination of note. But this is a Hinotori's image. Uh, you can see medical oid. This is a left, uh, maybe, how to say, expansion of the surgical field. This is a left uh, external iliac artery. This is an mm, object nerve. And this uh, right side the bladder. This is the right side. Right side. Hold the right side. This is uh, maybe 2020 or 2021 uh, surgery. Maybe, maybe recently the movement of the hand uh, make more uh, smoothly. This is a prostatectomy is one. And also maybe you can find the uh, very clear image. Uh, maybe we uh, cooperate with uh, uh, Stoltz and then Stoltz camera and the Hinotoy robotic systems can cooperate with whole this uh, good surgical images. This is the uh, uh, limit of the bladder and the bladder neck uh, how to say, cutting. The prostate and the bladder. And then we always see where is the limitation, limit is the limit of the bladder and the prostate. This bladder. And then you can see the inside of the brother, uh, caseta. So prostatectomy is always problematic uh, to see the uh, limit of the bladder and the prostate. But uh, this good fi uh, eye field is makes very uh, safe the surgeries. This is the vast difference. Maybe you can imagine or you can think the uh, surgical field uh, image is uh, much, much better than the uh, Da Vinci's one. This is a nerve sparing of right side. You know, I'm doing a little bit of the game. You 
address line and process. You can see the cassetta. This is the anastomosis of the brother and the urethra. Maybe the 2020 version, um, it's not so, not so smoothly uh, uh, moved. Uh, recently, they uh, and us uh, discussed many times, and then uh, the movement of the hand uh, make very smoothly now. Okay, this is a, a brother side. Sometimes we use the left hand, sometimes we use the right hand. This is a three zero V lock. This is the right side of anastomosis. It's almost done. Okay, this is a uh, surgical outcome. Surgery time is three hours, and 24 minutes. And then console time. Console time is uh, just uh, doing by robotics, uh, two hours and 15 minutes. And then complete without any complications. That's all. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Professor Sigmund, the nice presentation. May uh, come back to the seat. May also uh, be seated here. Uh, please give one more time a round of applause for him. Uh, this is a uh, presentation about how uh, clearly Japan is ahead in developing the their domestic robotic system, and hopefully it will motivate that we able to develop our uh, robotic system be applicate, uh, implement the robotic surgery in the near future in Indonesia. So, uh, to the... So let's uh, go to the next speaker, or second speaker is a professor in clinical microbiologies. He just recently finished her doctoral programs for in molecular medicine also graduated from Kobe University in Japan and without further ado please uh, welcome to the state uh, our respected professor professor dr tribibawa phd your time the time is yours sir Baik, uh, selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, our distinguished guest, Professor Singumera, and also all the member staff, staff member of uh, urology department, and also uh, president and also students from the urology department and other uh, department. And also uh, 
colleague that is joined us through Zoom from Taiwan and also Kobe University. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Tri Vibawa. I'm now uh, working in the Department of Microbiology in UGM. As uh, mentioned by the moderator, I was graduate from uh, Kobe University around 20 years ago. Uh, Professor Kumura was uh, in Osaka, I think, in that time. So, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for the OC to invite me to join this uh, precious meeting. And according to the OC, I should uh, deliver this speech. Yeah. Gimana caranya? Kesana. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, whatever, uh, what I want to uh, talk is about uh, some some of them are the theoretical thing and the other thing is uh, uh, my experience during work in uh, our clinical microbiology clinical microbiology uh, laboratory and i'd like to share with you that uh, there are at least i have uh, difficulties actually to 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 define the ordinary tract infection actually because there are many many papers, many people, many uh, society that uh, has their own definition. But I, I'd like to uh, deliver this one. Uh, there are at least, uh, we know that uh, some uh, our colleagues are uh, classified uh, UTI as a two, uh, two, two classification, where this uh, the, uh, uncomplicated and the other is uh, complicated. Whatever uh, uncomplicated means that uh, it is infection that is associated with uh, bladder and also other part of the urinary tract infection. And there is no structural abnormality, no comorbidity, meaning that there is no diabetes mellitus, there is no hypertension or other other condition that might uh, exaggerate the uh, symptom and sign of the UTI itself. And then also, one important thing in uh, the urology department, because you are a surgeon, then uh, the UTI that is not related with uh, urinary, urinary tract surgery is, uh, uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be defined as uncomplicated. The other part will be complicated. Uh, but, okay. Then, uh, talking about the pathogen that is uh, responsible for the uh, urinary tract infection is that uh, number one is still the most notorious is the urinary pathogenic Escherichia coli, or we use sometimes using this terminology, the UPEC here. And then the other is uh, Enterobacterialis, for example, here is Clepsalapnomony. And then the third is Stabilicus saprophyticus, it is gram positive, not like the second. And the first uh, class of the uh, agent that is responsible for the UTI, and the other will be uh, gram, uh, group B Streptococcus, Proteus mirabilis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Stop aureus, and also the last thing is uh, not bacterial, but it is a uh, uh, fungus. It is yeast. Yeah, you can see here among the uncomplicated and complicated uh, are almost similar pathogen that we will encounter in the clinic. The UPEC is number one still, though the, the what do you call it, the proportion is a bit different among the uh, uncomplicated and complicated one. Then I have difficulty to control this, sorry, okay. So can somebody just uh, help me to to move the slide? Okay, and then the, this is the risk factors. The why we need to to know the risk factors later on. We I will describe that one of the important thing to we uh, to do the uh, diagnostic stewardship. We call it as diagnostic stewardship. Is we need to know the risk factors of each uh, patient that is. Uh, have symptom and sign urinary tract infection, okay? Like that, for example, for the uncomplicated UTI, being a female and being of the older and younger people will be the risk factors for uncomplicated. And the other, 
for the complicated uh, UTI, you can see here the invasive uh, procedure that we are usually uh, introduced to our patient will be the risk factor for the, for the complicated UTI. For example, in welding catheter, sometimes almost, almost all the patient that we have in our uh, ward will have the, this intervention. And then also the immunosuppression. Immunosuppression we're talking about not always the drug that uh, uh, produce condition that uh, will, uh, ex will deteriorate the immune response, but being uh, admitted to the hospital uh, psychologically, they have uh, torturing by their condition, uh, being malnutrition because they don't have uh, any appetite anymore, for example, it is going to be result to immunosuppression. And then uh, unitec abnormality, of course, uh, the patient that is come to the uh, surgeon might have this problem. And then the most important is if you have the patient, it is already referred from other hospital or other clinic, then it is un, uh, unavoidable that uh, the patient might have the antibiotic exposure before. Yeah, and even sometimes from the first uh, first healthcare first layer of healthcare facility, the antibiotic uh, prescription has been already given to the patient. Or even sometimes patient in our case, they have already uh, taken the antibiotic without prescription because you know 70% of the uh, pharmacists in Indonesia selling the antibiotic without prescription. That is the truth, right? Next, please. Yeah, so this is the pathogenesis of UTI. Everybody know that there is a ascending process, meaning that it is come from the meatus urethri externus and then uh, ups and then uh, uh, by the common pathogen they going to introduce to our uh, urinary tract infection and then uh, it can involve uh, the whole urinary tract and then after that there is a balance between interaction within the uh, virulence factors that is uh, belong to the pathogen itself with the immune response that is uh, uh, protect us from the infection. Next please. So this uh, complicated picture I just want to show that every Every, every pathogen, they have their own virulence factors. For example, here for the UPEC, you can see that the type 1 phyllis or fimbria is one of the virulence factors that is going to facilitate them to attach with the uh, epithelial of the, our urine tract, and, urine tract. And then after that, the following process is there. Next, please. <clears throat> and then for the case, specific case, for example, about the catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Uh, this, uh, I bring the picture here of the proteus mirabilis that is, at least they have two, they have two virulence factors that is going to be uh, involved in the de development of the disease itself. The first is the, they have MRP pillars, and then the other uh, virulence factors, they have ability to produce the uh, and then after that, they're going to, uh, they're going to uh, cut uh, and metabolize the urea, and then they have going to be produce ammonia, for example. And then after that, <coughs> by using this uh, situation, they may have the potential uh, ability to produce the uh, biofilm. Yeah, the biofilm. Biofilm is a, a three dimensional structure that is produced by the consortia of the pathogen, not only the proteus marabilis, but also other pathogen, including the normal flora of the urinary tract, then they're going to exaggerate the symptoms and the sign, and also the pathogenesis uh, mechanism that is going to happen in our patient. Next, please. And this is another story when we talking about the Enterococcus vasculis. Yeah, Enterococcus vasculis is another notorious pathogen that I mentioned before. It is one of the pathogen that is uh, going to uh, uh, going to introduce the UTI to our patient. And again, 
the biofilm uh, production is the one that is going to exaggerate the uh, the exaggerate the clinical manifestation of the patient mm -hmm. itself. Next, please. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to talk about the challenge in diagnosis of the UTI. Please. Next. Yep. This is the list where the technology of the clinical microbiology is present now. This is going to be the technology that is going to help us to diagnosis uh, or confirmatory diagnosis in the clinic. So for example, you have a patient and then you, you have a suspicion of the UTI for the patient and then after that you will send the specimen to us. Then this is the method that we have. Yeah. Basically, there are two methods. Uh, one method is uncultured and the other is, uh, sorry, the uncultured method meaning without culturing the microbes and the other is uh, culturing microbe itself. Basically, uh, your specimen will be uh, detected by certain methods that is not uh, rely on the uh, isolation of the pathogen from the specimen and the other will be rely on the uh, isolation of your microbes. So I will not talk one by one, but I want next, please. I want to emphasize that the challenge in diagnosis is that uh, some of that laboratory method or tests are actually, it is laborious and clinically non-applicable. For example, uh, the recommendation is uh, the continuous uh, uh, monitoring of the uh, of the leukocytes rate, leukocyte extraction rate, for example, it is going to be laborious and sometimes it's not practical. But it is a gold standard without uh, culturing, for example. And it is also insensitive. Why it is insensitive? For example, uh, if we realize rely on the asterisk, uh, asterisk detection, for example, not all the, the not all of the pathogen will uh, will have the that enzyme, so we cannot approach with the, we cannot do the testing with that approach. And then also, sometimes it is false negative and false positive because of the next situation. Yeah, for example, the dilution of the sample itself. Yeah, sometimes we are not able to control how we, how we uh, obtain the sample. So dilution of the sample, for example, because of the condition where uh, <clears throat> dehydration, for example, or too much, too much uh, uh, overhydration will produce the urine that is not standardized. And then the second condition is uh, the use of the previous, previous antibiotics. It sometimes, somehow, though the antibiotic is not working to cure, but still it is going to uh, affect the concentration of the pathogen that is in the uh, uh, at that expression is now an in our urinary tract infection. And then I mentioned before, the third situation is where we dealing with a bacteria that is uh, not uh, produced the nitrate reductase enzyme that is going to be detected by uh, some of the tests that is employee uh, and culture method, for example, right? And then the other thing is that uh, not all the UTI is caused by the caused by the bacteria, but sometimes it is also caused by the fungus. Of course, this uh, uh, method will not apply to the fungus. Next uh, condition is that uh, some of the some of the chemical may interfere the uh, the method itself. And then the last is the biofilm. Uh, biofilm uh, producing microbes because when microbes producing biofilm they are going to attach in the bladder wall or they going to attach in the uh, catheter for example so concentration of the uh, bacteria will not be dispersed in the urine so of course because of that uh, somehow we cannot count the bacteria for example using gram staining with uh, or other other method to count the bacteria, for example, we are not able to uh, count precisely because the concentration of the bacteria in the urine is not uh, 
actually not uh, representative in the situation where the bacteria is uh, most of them are attaching to the cell uh, to the, uh, to the attaching to the wall of the bladder or uh, attaching to the uh, to the or um, to the catheter for example next yeah next please G. the next uh, is about the we talking about the culture method we rely on this especially in the clinical microbiological laboratory the problem is that uh, sometimes we know actually that uh, this method will not be applicable for all situation we are not uh, uh, we are not recommending the we are not recommending the all the patient will be screened using the culturing of the uh, of the urine for example the second thing is that uh, it is very hard to define uh, to define quantitatively the significant bacteriuria how much is the concentration we should uh, rely on to say that it is bacteria condition or it is not bacteriuria yeah and then uh, the next is defining the criteria for follow up yeah it is not recommended that when you have the UTA patient and then you treat it with antibiotic and then after that the follow up of this uh, treatment is not recommended using the reculture because it will not uh, have uh, beneficence for the patient the next one the last one is that uh, the uh, not all the bacteria will able to be grown when we are uh, culturing the urine in our laboratory for example though it is a uh, uh, very rare mycobacteria will not be able to be cultured with the with the uh, usual or regular method and other for example anaerobic bacteria though once again this anaerobic bacteria infection is very rare but still it is possible that we have the uh, uh, anaerobic bacteria but still we are not going to able uh, we are not going to be able to uh, to culture the uh, anaerobic bacteria using the usual method next please yeah that is the reason i think the first it is already uh, mentioned then the second we call it as fastidious bacteria fastidious bacteria is uh, the bacteria that is not easily uh, easily cultured for example <clears throat> and then you save the previous antibiotic uh, because we use already antibiotics so the the number of bacteria that is uh, present in the urine will be decreased and then somehow it is going to be uh, deteriorate the possibility to uh, be able to isolate the microbes from the urine yeah and then what about non-bacterial causative agent like fungal or virus of course we cannot uh, uh, detect these two uh, pathogen using the bacterial uh, uh, culture approach and then by film uh, format form not formatted yeah bacterial uh, producing biofilm producing bacteria may not uh, easily also be cultured because the concentration of the bacteria in the urine also uh, decreased next please so <clears throat> what we can do is that we going to do we, what we call it as uh, diagnostic stewardship. What is diagnostic stewardship is that we are not easily asking to the lab to detect or to do the test of the um, urinary tract infection because of what? Because that one, yeah. The first is that we have to emphasize that the pre-analytic, analytic and post-analytic will be will be uh, uh, properly done in the lab so we need to we need to emphasize that one and the second thing is that we are not testing all patient only patient that have the really documented sign and symptom of UTI will be tested and then we need to reemphasize generally yeah we need to reemphasize one two thing that the first thing is that even if we able to culture and the concentration of the pathogen is high but if the patient doesn't have the symptoms we are not recommended to treat the patient that the first uh, that is the first uh, 
first uh, first principle and the second principle is that uh, even though the patient actually have UTI there are symptoms and signs but sometimes sometimes when we culturing the concentrations of the bacteria will not will not significantly the number is not significantly uh, recognized so meaning that sometimes we are uh, ignoring that it is uh, UTI because of the concentration is very low. Yeah, next. So these are the scheme that actually we have to uh, keep in mind that we can doing the diagnostic stewardship uh, in uh, in uh, in synergistic synest synergistically with the uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So, for example, here. We do the evaluation of the symptom of the patient first. Do they are uh, clinically have the possibility to have a UTI or not? And then, if you think that uh, the symptoms and sign is uh, obvious, then we can send the specimen to the lab. Otherwise, we don't need that one. And then after that, you may recommend the empiric antibiotic uh, treatment. And then after that, we do the modification if necessary, the antibiotic according to the uh, susceptibility, drug susceptibility test result. Okay, and then that's for the diagnostic stewardship. And synergistic with that one, we can do the uh, uh, antimicrobial stewardship. What we can do is just that we, when we de ordering, make sure that the clinical uh, contact is there. And then make sure that there are no there is no clinical bias when we do the assessment about the risk factors. And then after that, we do the proper uh, specimen collection, and then we do the reporting properly also. Reporting is important. We have to make sure that whatever microbes that we isolate will be reported. If 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 only this pathogen is really true pathogen for the uh, condition of uh, the patient. And then after that, we do the optimized uh, and, uh, uh, empiric antibiotic uh, treatment and also the uh, specific antibiotic treatment after we have the uh, antimicrobial susceptibility test result. Next, please. Yeah. So what about the challenge in the treatment of the UTI? Please, yeah. The challenge is the first is the case definition itself. As I mentioned before, the case definition is blur because uh, there are many definitions. There are many societies that have their own definition. And then it is not uh, rely on the lab. It is rely on the clinical, uh, clinical manifestation. The second thing is that the causative agent itself. Causative agent is notorious and it can be responsible in the upper and lower urinary tract infection. And then the other challenging is the because of the resistance of the antibiotic resistance of the, uh, that is uh, spread in our patient. Yeah. The incidence of the uh, antimicrobial resistance among the pathogen that is responsible for the UTI is increasing every day. And then the other challenge is uh, about this, the particular condition of particular characteristic of the patient. For example, catheter-associated UTI, urethral dysfunction, or impaired host uh, response need another consideration to decide what antibiotic or when are you going to treat with the antibiotic. Next, please. This is one example. Wow, uh, about the challenging of the uh, antimicrobial treatment in the UTI patient. This, I got this from the Australian government. And then you can see the trimetropim, nitrofurantoin, and cephalexin is the one, the antibiotic that is uh, as a first choice. Okay? And then if you see, next please, if you see another recommendation, this is in the UK. You can see here, the recommendation is completely different. Yeah, The algorithm that they going to recommend to the doctor to do the antibiotic uh, 
uh, treatment is completely different. So the question is, which guideline we should, which kind then we should uh, we should uh, apply or implement in our patient? Next, please. Yeah. So that is the challenge of the treatment. Yeah. So in summary, I recommend to us to do the diagnostic stewardship, meaning that please do not easily sending the urine to our lab because sometimes it is going to be overwhelmed. Yeah. Or please also do not uh, use this uh, culturing or testing of urine as a routine screening because it is, uh, uh, it is not reasonable to do that as we know that actually only certain patient that is need to be con to be confirmed it is has UTI or not. The second thing is that antibiotic prescription should be rely on the pattern of the pathogen and also pattern of the antimicrobial locally. Locally mean in your hospital. Make sure that you have the antibiogram, make sure to have the uh, the data and then after that using the guideline only for the uh, particular condition but the last thing that you have to do is using the local recommendation ya saya kira itu yang bisa sampaikan terima kasih assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you very much professor dr tri wibo for the presentation it is a nice presentation uh, it's a common case in Indonesia, of course, about urinary tract infection, and sometimes we, as uh, general practitioner, sometimes uh, underestimate them and not treat it properly. But in here, we can learn that if we do not treat it properly, it could lead to a bigger problems in the future, such as the antibiotic resistance. So uh, let's go on to the next uh, topics, or third and last speakers. He is our beloved teacher and one of the most highly respected urologists in the country. He just recently finished her, his doctoral programs in the Universitas Gajah Mada and his main field of interest in, in urology oncology and has a handful experience and course in minimal invasive surgery. In this morning, he would like to share to us about what could can we do for incidental prostate cancer after troop from Yogyakarta experience. To Dr. Indra Warman, specialist role consultant, the time is yours. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Halim, it's for your kind introduction. I think it's too much. Yeah. And first of all, uh, I would like to thanks to organizing committee, Dr. Yuri. Thank you for organizing this meeting very well. And also to our beloved teacher, Professor Trivi Bawa, and also our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, our sensei, Professor Katsumi Sigumara. Will come back again. I think it's already third or fourth visit in Indonesia, yeah. And yeah, before COVID, last one is 2019. I uh, we traveled together, and I do really sorry. My flight uh, yesterday was a little bit delayed. I arrived in the evening, so cannot join with you. So, uh, and also all the students and all the participants today uh, will come, and we are very happy today uh, to learn from the two giants. I feel like a dwarf, yeah, because they are very uh, well known in as a researcher, as a surgeon, and also a microbiologist, but now I'm just a beginner. Uh, but I will try to speak in English, yeah, um, because my English is actually not even my second language. My first language, my mother is Indonesian, Japanese, and now my kids and my wife speak in Russian, and I uh, become slowly, slowly uh, forget my English. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> if you, I hope you can still uh, uh, understand what I'm talking about, yeah. My topic today is about uh, what uh, we can do in a uh, incidental prostate cancer after TURP. It's our experience in Sarsito Hospital. Uh, as, as we know here that the uh, yeah. slide yeah. Oh pointernya di sana. So ini apa? Bisa diarahkan ke oh. laptop yang sana. Pointernya ke Hah? itu. Oh iya yeah, iya yeah. oke okay, oke. Okay. Okay, as we know that the prostate cancer is uh, still uh, very frequent. It's number five among the uh, cancer in male in Indonesia. In worldwide, maybe number in second, but we are number five. 
and around approximately 13,000 cases annually diagnosed and I believe this number will going uh, higher and higher since our population getting older and older as well. And in Asia, we see the, here uh, there are some uh, difference among the uh, countries. Yeah. In a well-developed country like uh, Professor Sigumura uh, country in Japan, is uh, more patients come to clinics with uh, localized disease. It's around 70 or 80 percent and only around 10 until 20 percent is a metastasis disease. But in our country, you can see here, based on the uh, quite a long ago, yeah, 10 years publication, yeah, it's uh, still around 50 to 60 percent of our patient is already de novo metastasis. And even I did my research uh, around 100 uh, patients, our PS uh, patient come uh, uh, fifty two point three percent already metastasis and their PSA level you can see here is in the median PSA is four five hundred twenty four so uh, we are have uh, we have more and more uh, patient with the late uh, stage of prostate cancer uh, so back to our topic today about incidental prostate cancer what is uh, incidental prostate cancer is a uh, prostate cancer uh, diagnosed incidentally after surgery for BPH yeah because uh, without any previous suspicion of cancer. So uh, the surgeon before uh, examined the PSA level is, was normal and during the digital rectal examination, there are no any suspicious lesion and they perform a TURP or homeum laser enucleation and then after the pathologic result uh, show the prostate cancer. And uh, another can be, uh, is very rare, yeah, I even never uh, found this, yeah. Uh, after cystoprostatectomy for bladder cancer or after autopsy. This is also very rare. In, but actually, it's in our center, it's also not uh, a small number. It's 19.6% uh, uh, in our series, a patient uh, come with uh, incidental prostate cancer. And how to manage uh, prostate cancer in incidentally finding? I think it's, uh, we, we have to follow the guideline yeah, from the uh, T1A and T1B management. Yeah, basically there are three modalities that we can uh, give as alternative to our patient. The first is active surveillance. The second is performing a radical prostatectomy, especially for the patient with T1B cancer and the Gleason score in uh, or ISOP grade is uh, uh, higher uh, than six. Yeah, uh, Gleason score and if the radiotherapy is a preferred treatment in patient with prior history of uh, surgery for PPH. Yeah. Okay. So what is active surveillance? It's, it's very ideal to the patient who have a PSA level less than 10 preoperatively or more than one uh, postoperatively or PSA density less than 0 0.08. And based on the uh, tumor characteristic, uh, we have to see that the ISOP grid is uh, grid one or Gleason is six and uh, uh, if we have also to consider about the life expectancy for the patient with the low uh, life expectancy less than 10 years uh, active surveillance become uh, mandatory for this case and what we have to do to uh, our patient in active surveillance is a strict protocol including digital rectal examination at least once yearly and PSA checking at least once every six months and repeated POPC every two until three years. If you have a MRI facility, it's, uh, we can perform uh, if uh, repeat uh, uh, MRI or uh, if PSA rising or PSA doubling time is less than three years. That was uh, the two uh, strong recommendation from the guideline. And how about the radical prostatectomy? Uh, the patient with the T1B and a poorly differentiated tumor, I mean the Gleason score is high, and a high level PSA level after TURP more than one, and a life expectancy more than 10 years uh, will have a more benefit uh, with this uh, procedure. The, how about the external radiotherapy? It also become an alternative of a patient who cannot uh, do the surgery. Uh, and we have to remember here that uh, some patient will have a uh, more complication uh, 
uh, urinary incontinence occur uh, 10 times higher in the patient with history of the surgery before, uh, like a TURP before. And we have to remember also uh, to uh, keep the ADT in intermediate uh, disease along with the radiation. We can have uh, like a 7 degree in uh, 6 weeks, yeah, 28 fractions. But don't forget to continue the ADT in the short uh, period for until 6 months. It's for the intermediate disease and for the high risk disease. Uh, we have to continue ADT at least uh, two years. Yeah, this is a strong uh, recommendation not to just give the local therapy, but to combine with the systemic therapy with ADT. And uh, what about our experience in Sarjito Hospital? Uh, we perform not very much. Yeah, since our patient uh, come, as I mentioned before, with the metastasis disease, so not so many localized disease come to our uh, center. Uh, we just start our laparoscopic radical prostatectomy in 2020 and it's become our standard of care of, to our patient and we don't have any a, a lot of experience with open because open surgery is in for radical prostatectomy it's quite challenging and very 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 tiring procedure so we are move uh, very fast to laparoscopic and i think uh, we uh, we wait for the robot inotori maybe you know, one day can come to our country to help our uh, to help with our hand yeah <laughs> to <laughs> to avoid some uh, maybe carpal tunnel syndrome or maybe <laughs> our back uh, pain yeah so uh, i think uh, this is the future of our uh, treatment and uh, we have to remember also if our patient have a history of TURP before, yeah. so uh, please uh, consider that you have to advise the patient about uh, the first is the possibility of the positive surgical margin is significantly higher and the recovery rate from uh, is erectile dysfunction is also significantly lower and also urinary continence in third month after the surgery are also significantly lower comparing to the patient who didn't have any uh, history of TURP before. And also the uh, sugar also proposed a time interval. So I after the TURP, usually there will be still inflammation pro uh, process, yeah? And we have to await uh, minimal three months before we uh, go to the, TU uh, the, the laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. And maybe during waiting, we can uh, give some uh, new adjuvant ADT plus uh, anti androgen uh, new hormonal uh, new hormonal therapy yeah because in some series also uh, some publication reveals that the new adjuvant ADT plus androgen receptor targeted agent uh, can uh, uh, lower uh, can com can uh, maximize the pathologic complete response and this is uh, our uh, case the examen, uh, example of our case yeah and today we have uh, the quite similar cases yeah we have some patient referred from previous hospital diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer by TURP and they sent to us and we do uh, staging this patient was a gentleman 60 years old with ECOG star 1 and uh, he supposed TURP with glycine 3 plus 3 I sub grade 1 and the uh, PSA pre-op is no data because some insurance issue in our country uh, prevent the doctor to check the PSA because PSA is not as uh, cannot be afford in it our daily uh, life in our daily patients and the PSA pass up was up we check is quite high it's above 20 so it's a high risk case and bone scan reveal no metastatic lesion and we diagnosed with the adenocarcinoma prostate clinical T1B and 0M0 I subgrade 1 and we do MRI and still no extra capsular extension so we perform uh, we try to perform a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy since it high risk we also do a pelvic lymph node dissection okay yeah uh, in our standard Laparoscopic, we use a uh, four trocar yeah, in umbilicus and one in the uh, five, uh, 10 millimeter in umbilic, uh, umbilicus and 10 millimeter in 
and the ripe uh, para umbilical and the two five millimeter port in the left uh, para umbilical and para rectal. And I'm sorry if imaging is not so good, yeah, like Professor Sigumera, yeah, it's quite uh, low pixel, yeah. Yes, this is, uh, and we have to remember that this is after the URP cases, it's uh, a lot of uh, blood, yeah, not like uh, some addition and some inflammation cause more blood, yeah, and we have to be patient and control the bleed, and we routinely do by extra peritoneal uh, access. We are creating a red seal space here and we uh, move to the bladder neck. Yeah. You see the balloon of the catheter and we cut the bladder neck. Yeah. You can see here the anatomic is not so uh, clear yeah, because the inflammation by uh, post URP process. You see here the physical of a seminal physical and the fast difference and we cut the dissecting the fast difference in the posterior of the prostate in this case because it's a high risk uh, patient we didn't do nerve sparing and we are moved to the here the endopelvic fascia, we cut the urethra and put on the endobeck. And then we come to the quite challenging process, is a <laughs> urethra, a physical urethral anastomosis, yeah. I think this is the benefit of using robot yeah. Yeah, yeah i think it's uh we have uh here we use uh barb suture yeah yeah it's quite challenging yeah if you it, we have to be very patient in this stage because uh not high of no man degree of manipulation is not as high as yes, if you have a robot yeah, and you will be uh, very fatigued and tiring after this uh, procedure and we continue the <laughs> with uh, perfect uh, lymph node dissection okay so this follow in the follow up uh, actually the if you see the blood is coming but uh, we check the hemoglobin level Depletion is very low, actually. Uh, this is the benefit of minimal invasive surgery. We can uh, really control the bleed, uh, bleeders uh, better than if you do uh, open surgery. And also, there are some effect of the pressure of the gas, which uh, compress the vein. So uh, the blood loss uh, is really uh, lower if you significantly lower compared to the open surgery. And this is the patient was discharged in the POD4 and the histopathology here, very interesting, is upgraded. Before was uh, isocrit uh, 1 and now become a grid, grid grab uh, 4. Maybe if you perform TURP, the specimen is come from the paraureteral, periureteral uh, zone, which is have a uh, more a lower isocrit comparing if you take all the prostate, which contain more uh, higher uh, grid of the prostate adenocarcinoma and the patient have continent status achieved of uh, three months uh, after surgery and uh, up to now the PSA level is still under 0 0.1 which is uh, acceptable the take home basis is uh, even in the era of white uh, use of the MRI and PSA we can still have a uh, opportunity to see the patient with incidental prostate cancer around 5 until 11 years 11 percent uh, in our series is 19.6 percent so uh, there are some management that can be uh, alternative can be given to our patient. The first is active surveillance, second is pro uh, prostatectomy radical, and the third is uh, radiotherapy. And uh, things to consider in the APCA management is first is patient factor. We see uh, the PSA level, PSA density, uh, the life expectancy of the patient, and also the 
two more characteristic, uh, which is uh, ISO grid uh, group, which is very important uh, to uh, to predict the characteristic of the patient. Once again, uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I uh, welcome the future collaboration. Uh, this was before, before pandemic, yeah. Professor Sigimura with me uh, go to with Dr. Yuri. Yeah. This is the dean, Professor Fujisawa, the dean of Co uh, medical faculty from Kobe. Yeah. Yeah, so he is. The, you can see who is the boss, and uh, I don't know. The boss usually sit behind or in front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think uh, that's all my presentation. I feel very sorry if there are some mistakes. Yeah. Uh, I hope this can uh, give you some. Uh, future and I invite you to for the discussion. Thank you. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much Dr. Indra Warman for the nice presentation and uh, an example for uh, incidental prostate cancer case treated properly and I would like to invite to all of the speaker to be seated in the stage to because we would like to enter the discussion or question and answer session. Is there any audience here would like to ask a question or some question to the speaker, please? Maybe from the medical students? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh. Please, uh, please stand up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. F please. Uh, Sir. Yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, thank you, Professor Katsumi Sigamura. Um, we are from young doctors my name is Deogra first I want I would like to question about how has robotic minimal invasive surgery revolutionized serology procedures and what are some key advantages it offers compared to traditional surgical approaches and uh, about what is the difference in Da Vinci technology and uh, uh, Hinotori. Hinotori technology. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It's intended to Prof. Sigamura. So he is a medical student currently in the internal clinical rotation asking about how the robotic surgery uh, revolutionized the surgery and about the disadvantages and disadvantages of the robotic surgery. Please. Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, okay. Compared with the open surgery, we can get a very, very low volume of the blood loss. For instance, in open surgery era, we have uh, about 1,000 milliliter for blood loss. So now it's uh, less than 50 milliliter. It's a big, big difference. And then compared to the laparoscopic surgery, uh, as uh, the Dr. Indra, short so we can easily do the anastomosis bladder urethral anastomosis is very difficult for us to do by the laparoscopic surgery but robotic surgery uh, is very easy to do for the bladder urethral anastomosis and then comparison with the da vinci system Hinotori can show the very good or clear images like you before, uh, like you see. So this is a very uh, good merit for the Hinotori system. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Prof. Is there any follow-up question for, from you? No? Okay, thank you very much. So on to the next one. Is there any audience who'd like to ask our speakers. Yeah, please. Uh, 
Thank you for the uh, time. Uh, my name is Saleh. I am a urology resident from Universitas Gajah Mada. My question to Professor Chigimura. Uh, we know that the surgery in robotic is uh, have a lot of advantages, but uh, if we knew that not all surgeons maybe can do uh, a good robotic skills, uh, what do you think about uh, the skills of the surgery in robotics? How long does the surgery or, or a surgeon can learn uh, to do the robotics? Or maybe uh, is there any uh, particular uh, skills or maybe the skills that the surgeon can do to enhance the skills in robotic surgery? Thank you very much, Dr. Saleh. Again, this is the question for you. Professor Sigemura, he asked about maybe about the learning curve for uh, maximizing or fluently using the robotic surgery. Yes. Okay, thank you for your question about the surgical skills uh, learning. So we have started the robotic surgery in 2010 using Da Vinci system. And then, so, okay. Uh, they have the surgeon and the assistant. We have two assistants in the uh, how say, operation room. And then maybe other one to two doctors uh, join the surgery. And then they uh, have uh, some opinion or they have, uh, no, no, they are learning for future uh, surgeon's experience. So maybe seeing, seeing operation is very important seeing, discuss, and then preparation, and then, how to say, reflect, oh, no, no, study afterwards. So maybe, uh, maybe compared to the open surgery, we always record the surgery uh, to our system. And then even me, even me, I have uh, take the video from the recording and then we see, uh, I see uh, many times. And then sometimes I go to the uh, Da Vinci's company, Wahinotori's company, and then training. Even, even now I'm doing training. So when I uh, do the surgeries, uh, maybe one to two weeks before. So practice and then study from the others and then study uh, using the uh, movies. Uh, is uh, maybe continuation is a very uh, how to say good tool for the surgical skills improvement. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Prof. Sigmund. So uh, the key is to never stop practice and always uh, con learning continuously. But uh, how about maybe the cases, the number of cases maybe a surgeon needed or uh, should try to become comfortable doing the robotic surgery itself or how long does it take in term of years maybe? Okay, thank you for your question. Okay, maybe for my case, uh, until 10 cases, we just do only part of the surgery, maybe 10 years ago. But recently, maybe from those kind of experience in your university, so maybe the beginner can do all of the parts uh, in, um, under our uh, say, instructions. So sometimes the people uh, only, no, no, even in the first case, they can complete maybe only in two and a half hours under our uh, instructions. So maybe recently the people uh, who have done the robotic system uh, for a long time, Maybe uh, it depends on the people, and it depends on the surgeons, and it depends on the surgeons' preparation. So preparation is very important. And then mostly I recently uh, take part in the, how to say, instructions. But once the, I feel the surgeons uh, prepare a lot, uh, I, can give you, uh, I can give the surgeons a lot of times. But two and a half hours completion is maybe 
enough in the safe surgery, uh, maybe need to prepare a lot uh, going to the good surgeons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the answer, Professor Sigimura. Uh, it is a, both of them is a nice, uh, good, very good question. Is there any more question? Maybe, yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Aliana. I am a resident from Universitas Gajah Mada. I have a question for Dr. Indra Rahman uh, about the uh, contribution of laparoscopic radical prostatectomy on improving uh, surgical precision and patient outcomes in surgical uh, in urological procedures, especially in here in Jakarta, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, Dr. Ali. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Ali. Okay, the question is about uh, what is the benefit of using laparoscopic uh, over the open surgery? Yeah, yeah it's very huge. Yeah, huge uh, benefit. Yeah, the first, of course, is the big, like any other minimal invasive surgery, it will uh, keep the uh, good outcome and uh, as professor sugimura say it's uh, it's uh, one first very important is to prevent the bleeding yeah. we know the uh, as surgeon we have three big enemy the, the two enemy can come intraoperatively blood loss infection yeah professor uh, three yes yeah, it's very important to avoid this and by using laparoscopic you can avoid to to make a bleeding because by laparoscopic or even robotic, very uh, robotic advances have a 3D. Or laparoscopic, we have to use uh, glasses to uh, make a 3D sensation. Yeah, but in robotic, Professor Sigumura, by naked eye we can see the 3D. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, compared with uh, when I learned in Germany 2015, around eight year back. Yeah, with the Da Vinci SI edition, the eyes fix. Yeah, but Professor Sigumura robot. I can be adjusted to our body weight, body height. Yeah. So the first is of uh, reduce blood uh, loss. Yeah. The second is to also to uh, make a more uh, precis precision. We know that our surgery, especially in oncology, we have to make the patient uh, uh, cancer free. Yeah. The first oncological principle is to eradicate the cancer. So by laparoscopic, we can see with with the magnification which one is the still like a tomorrow's uh, appearance uh, and it's very clear because have a magnification so it's a, the positive surgical margin will be less yeah but of course yeah you need to be trained yeah because laparoscopic surgery uh, is a uh, need uh, time and learning curve uh, very slope yeah not and yeah it's i don't know some research say that the, the student have a lot of gaming uh, experience and eye coordination will be better and endoscopic and laparoscopic learning curve will be faster but <laughs> I, d I don't know which kind of game can increase your uh, skill yeah. and yeah I, th I think that robotic uh, surgery has a very better uh, outcome in terms of uh, surgeon maneuver yeah, and precision and also to prevent uh, exhaustive condition afterwards and to prevent injury if even yeah yeah, after the long uh, surgery, especially in the meticulous procedure. Yeah. So, yeah, Professor Sugimura, uh, really, I really want to come to try your robot Hinotori. <laughs> if maybe in the next summer. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. Is this uh, answering your question? Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Indraman, for the answer. So even uh, only using laparoscopic, we, even if we're not doing the robotic surgery, it also already gives the surgeon much more benefit than the open surgery, yeah, doctor. Yeah. Uh, is there any more question uh, and from the audience would like to ask to the speakers? 
is there also any question from the Zoom maybe? Could the operator help me? Not yet? Not yet. Okay, thank you. So please stand up. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Raya Diardo. I'm a resident urology from Universi Universitas Gajah Mada. I'd like to uh, ask a question uh, for Prof. Uh, Tri Wibowo. Uh, I'm, I would like to ask, uh, in diagnosing a UTI, there is any advancement in technology for developing an effective method for diagnosing the UTI? Doc? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you please uh, to repeat the question one more time? Uh, in diagnosing a UTI urinary tract infection, uh, there is an advancement uh, for using the technology uh, for making the effective method in the diagnosing of the UTI. So how the effective method? Yes, okay. effective yeah. in the technology. <coughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned before, the the one that is I presented as a uncultured method. Actually, there is also uh, they using the AI. Also, they are using the robotic system or automatic system actually to counting the like a side to counting the bacteria actually right but the problem is that it is not going to answer everything for example the esterase for example they are not uh, produced by acetomonas they are not produced by the candida they are not produced by other uh, gram positive for example so meaning that this technology it is already advancement but still the, because the causative agent is uh, use and not all are not all the pathogen are bacteria not all pathogen are enterobacteria say so then some of the uh, approach will not cover everything that's the limitation so so almost um, the situation is almost the same in other situations because we are dealing with a various uh, pathogen uh, I always uh, I always uh, explaining like this. If I, uh, if you are, you comparing me and Prof. Sigumura, for example, of course it's a phenotypically different, right? I'm uh, dark, you are not, right? But still, uh, we are Asian, but still we are Homo sapiens. So the genetic uh, discrepancy among me and Prof. Sigumura may be less than 0.01 percent of our gene. Okay. But if you're talking about Klebsiella, comparing the E. coli, for example, the difference may be more than 30% of the genetics. So meaning you are like talking me and tiger, or me with a cow, for example, because we are different genes. So in that case, it is going to be difficult to uh, have the technology that we still going and that will cover, for example, detecting Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus saprophyticus with the Klebsiella pneumoniae or E. coli. That's the problem. Yeah, I think it is challenging still to to increasing or to developing the technology AI, for example, or robotic system. Also, in this case, sure, but not this time. Maybe we need a Another time, after after another technology come, for example, the brain-computer interface, like uh, what we are dreamed by Elon Musk, for example, when you are able to implant the computer in your brain, and then you can just blinking, and then the computer will work for you, for example. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Professor, for the for the answer. So there's an advance, already an advancement in the diagnostic works up, but still not able to answer anything yet because we are dealing with a uh, different entity of various bacteria with various properties. So there's uh, maybe one last question from the Zoom. The question is intended for Prof. Sigemura. Is there any 
difference between learning laparoscopy and robotic surgery and do you need a special course for someone who is already proficient in laparoscopic surgery to be proficient in robotic surgery the question is from dr eko subakti he is also our teacher and urologist in the uh, banyumas hospital okay thank you for your question about the uh, special course for uh, laparoscopy or robotic surgery so okay recently the surgeons robotic surgeons who had no experience on open surgery people still can do robotic surgery without any complications so but uh, how to say as i mentioned in my slides we have a uh, uh, how to say uh, learning course for robotic surgery uh, surgeons version in the first assistant versions and also uh, in my university who those who has uh, the uh, has a right of doing robotic surgery need to need to pass the uh, examination for the laparoscopic uh, has a board surgeons in japan urology gynecology general surgeons has a uh, such a laparoscopic surgeons board exam so just we need to send our video and then they judge and then maybe 40 to 45 percent can pass the examination and then maybe our university has our urology maybe they are 15 board laparoscopic surgeon is there and then we can do the uh, robotic surgery system. we can do the robotic surgery so maybe uh, in our system we need to you know have the board for laparoscopic surgery and then going to robotic surgery and then mostly can do safely and uh, complete so in my opinion, the board for robotic surgeons is necessary for safe surgeons of robotic system. Thank you, Radesh. Thank you very much, asking. Prof. Sigmar. So basically, the, uh, on your country, the transition from laparoscopic to robotic is doing by a stepwise approach, but actually uh, a surgeon that haven't done laparoscopic before is could could also be performed robotic surgery without any complication. So I hope it will uh, encourage all of us, uh, the surgeon, the urologist, to perform uh, minimal invasive surgery, including robotic surgery in the near future. So ladies and gentlemen and all of the audience, uh, I think it's uh, our interesting discussion has already come to an end. Please uh, give a round of applause one more time for all of the speakers for this interesting this morning discussion and uh, we hope we can learn something new and take this uh, to the our daily practice on the Thank you for the honorable speakers for the lecture given. We would also like to thank Dr. Halim for leading the lecture and allowing us to learn different perspectives on urology. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Halim for being the moderator for today. Now we would like to give a token of appreciation dedicated to Professor Shigemura. The plate will be given by Professor Tri on behalf of the organizing committee of this event.
Now we would like to get another photo session for the guests. You may go on stage. Okay. We have come to the end of the event talking about minimally invasive surgery in urology, urinary tract infection hosted by the Division of Urology, Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health, and Nursing of Universitas Gajah Mada. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Shigemura, Professor Tri, and Dr. Indra Warman for giving us the guest lecture today and then allowing us to learn and expand our knowledge on this field. For participants of this event, you may take your food outside located on the way out after this session. On behalf of the host and organizing committee, we extend our appreciation for your support and active participation to this event, and also thank you for those joining us online. I'm Charlotte Nashita Sandi, thank you, wishing you a great and productive afternoon. Thank you very much. Terima kasih.